Uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about queues, buses, and the messenger component. Uh, you'll find my slides later on my home tech. Uh, so let's let's get started. Let's dive right into it. This is a stack. A stack has a top and a button, and it's a very common data structure. You put things on the top and you remove things from the top. It is a last in, first out. If you flip it, you will get a queue. A queue has a back and a front. It's a first in, first out, and order is important. Queues and stacks are very cheap. They have a co order the complexity of order one for adding and removing items. And I'm not gonna talk any more about the data structure. I'm confident that uh, some of you know this already. I'm gonna talk about how I made application in the past and how I make applications now. And this is not really a journey in time. It's more of a, it's more of a journey in my experience. And again, Short about me, I'm Tobias Nile. I work at Happier, I do plenty of uh, Symfony stuff, I run PHP meetups in Stockholm, and I do plenty of open source. Um, I, I started my open source career in 2015. PSR 6 just came out, so me and a friend, we created PHP Cache. And at the same time, I'm, I was interested in HP Plug, which was a abstraction over the two major HP clients at the time, which was Gussel 5 and Gussel 6. Um, and when you do API, uh, HTTP clients, you also do API clients and mail clients. And I, yeah, I wrote my own PSR 7 implementation. Basically, I wrote the test suite for PSR 7 and noticed that none of them existing implementations were compliable 100%. So I wrote my own to show how you should write PSR 7 implementation. Uh, yeah, and a bunch of other things. What I'm most interested at the moment, where I spend most of my open source time, is on async AVS. It is a super thin and user-friendly AVS SDK. And if you, you should use it if you don't want to download like 20 megabytes of source code to use S3. You can use async AVS and you download like 500K. Um, yeah, let's get started. I want to bring you back to 2013. I was working on Happier. I have been doing Symfony for about four years already, and I loved Symfony. I loved everything about Symfony. I loved Symfony t-shirts, Symfony mugs. I loved Symfony blog posts. I loved Symfony, everything about Symfony. And Symfony had this concept of bundles, and obviously I loved the bundles. So I created bundles for everything. I created bundles for like if you want to have some comment section, I create a comment bundle. If you want to have an interview booking section of the website page, I create a booking bundle. And I had like 30 or 40 different bundles in this project. And the bundle itself was, <laughs> was filled with stuff. I mean, bundle had their own configuration, had their own services, had their own views, had their own translation, had their own JavaScript, CSS, and maybe even tests. Like they have everything in, in, a, uh, in the bundle. And the bundles, they had some symphony magic to it as well. Like if you wanted to have a CLI command, you were supposed to put it in a folder called command, and the file name has to end with the word command, or else it wouldn't work. And nobody will tell you why, but that's what's one of the symphony magic things. And I knew of and I loved, obviously. And at the time, I wrote controllers like this. This is a controller for like importing uh, data to a database from CSV. And the code is not really important, but it's fat and it's large and big. And if I wanted this, if I wanted this logic in a CLI command, I just copied the code and added it in my command class. I was I was pretty happy about myself at this point. I considered myself to be a Symphony expert, and obviously. I had no problem maintaining this code. If you asked me, where is this feature located? I knew exactly which bundle it was in. I knew exactly which file it was in. I thought I knew everything about this code. And as you maybe could, could guess, I was working alone in this project. Um, I, know, I know that I could improve somehow. I, I know that you start using services but because services were in theory testable. And all over Twitter, at the time, people telling telling this, like, you should test your controllers, register your controllers as services, you should test your controllers. And I, I was like, why should I test my controllers? I, like, I don't test anything else, why are the controllers special? But I realized I should move more logic into services instead of having them in a controller. But at the same time, developing code in a controller 
it's you can, you have this kind of warm feeling like it's it's very simple you're just one method call away to getting the current user and it's easy to use the container to get parameters or any service you want and it's it's quite convenient so i'm tr i was trying to bring this convenience into services so i created something to call a a current user provider so i could easily get the current user from whichever service i liked and i was super impressed by myself i even opened a pr on symphony and said hey everybody should use this current user provider and i was kindly but firmly told that i was wrong uh, the current user is a value object and value objects should not they hold state and state should not be in services i I, I was thinking a lot about this. I, I understood the arguments. I, I have a lot of discussions with friends and other people online about this PR specifically. And it, it took me a while to realize that I was wrong. Like, I think at the time it was Symfony version 2.6 or something. And at that time you had the request, the HTTP request as a service, which is also wrong. And that's why the, the, the dependency injection container introduced something called scopes. And the most, because if you wrote a CLI command, you couldn't use the request service because it didn't exist. And that's why you had different scopes in the dependency injection. So every time, well, half the time you get exceptions thrown, you can't use the request because of the wrong scope. And if this sounds like magic or weird, it is. It was like, like the most Googled question of Symfony at the time. So Symfony decided to remove the request as a service uh, because it's a value object. And I was told that in this PR, I was told that if you wanted the current user, you should pass it as an argument to a function. You should not use it as a service. So I slowly, slowly started to realize that having Symfony all over the place wasn't maybe the best idea. And just because I loved Symfony, I, should, I was maybe overdoing it. Um, and sure, it introduced a lot of magic as well. And at this point in time, Matthias Noback was traveling Europe with a concept or a talk that we basically said, when to framework. And Matthias Noback, he had given me so much inspiration. I, I've been reading all his blogs, watched his talks, bought his books and everything. I, I'm, I'm super impressed by Matthias Noback. And when he, came to, when he came and talked about when to framework, I, I really believed him because this was the third year I met him. The first year I met him, he said, Symfony is great. This Symfony is the best framework ever. You should always use a framework. And year number two, he said, frameworks are evil. Frameworks are bad. Don't use frameworks. So when year number three, he came and said, this is when you should use frameworks. And this is when you should not use frameworks. I believe that he really done his homework and he really had put some lot of thought in this. So he told me, or he, he told the audience, uh, one thing that I, that I would like to share with you today, I, he told us about hexagonal architecture, which basically means that you should keep your core of application, your kernel, you should keep that away from the infrastructure. Let the framework handle all the infrastructure stuff. And the infrastructure layer talks with your core using messages. So the infrastructure layer talks with uh, your HTTP, CLI, file system, and then converts messages and and give the messages to the core. So I'm like, okay, uh, I'm in. So I created messages all over the place. So have, here, was your mess, here you see messages for create company and then I have a create company handler. So the only thing my controller doing now is they take something from HTTP and creates a message. They put the message on the bus and the bus somehow finds my message handler and the message handler is executed. So the bus here is now a boundary between the real world and my application. And as you maybe can imagine, if I wanted the same functionality as a CLI command, I took the CLI arguments, converted it, converted it to the same message, and then I put it on the bus. So my core is not, not, it's not so my core is not connected to Symfony anymore. It's not connected to the HTTP. It's not connected to anything else. It's just PHP and it's just my code. And in 2006, I took in an intern. This person has only been working with Laravel before. He, he was, has never seen Symfony, so he was a bit nervous starting working with me because I was this Symfony person and I only had Symfony applications. But after a few weeks, he said to me like, hey, this, 
this is actually quite simple. I, I, I understand my way around the applications because it's just PHP. Uh, oops. So this is the crash course I gave you on hexagonal architecture. There's a lot of resources. Here are a few of them. You should, I mean, go Google it or start with this list. So what did we really win here? Why couldn't we just call the message handler directly? And the quick answer is middleware. We have now the possibility to add middleware. And I, if for those of you who doesn't know middleware, they, they are so it's the class where you can so that the bus gives the message to. So you have your controller creates a message and they put the message on the bus. The bus is calling the first middleware and then it calling the second middleware and then the third middleware, etc. And then eventually your message comes to the message handler. And you can have middlewares for anything you like. For example, you can have middleware for logging. So you always log every message that goes on the bus. You can have middleware for validation. So you make sure the message is in the correct format. You can have middlewares for transactions that put your uh, handler logic in a single database transaction. And also, maybe more importantly for this talk, you can have messages, I mean, middlewares for queue. So let's talk about queues. You know the data structure from the intro. And now we're going to talk about queues as a service. So a normal setup is a work queue. And a work queue has a producer that adds messages on the queue, say, send this email or generate this PDF. And then you have one or more consumers that are consuming these messages and execute the, the, uh, the work. And this is technically called competing consumers. But it, I, in my mind, they're actually helping each other consuming the queue. But anyhow, so you have two consumers, and if consumer B goes down for a while, consumer A keeps processing the messages. And when consumer B comes up back up, it actually it, it just continues with the next message. And there are two things that are important here. You should make sure that the queue is durable, which means that messages are stored on disk and not only in memory. So if your queue go down, you won't lose all your messages. And you should also configure your queue to use acknowledgement. That means that a Consumer takes a message, it doesn't work, and then the queue says, I've acknowledged this message, I've handled it, everything is fine. So if the queue notices that a message is taken and they never get an acknowledgement, the queue would assume that this consumer died, so it would automatically respawn the message. So every message always gets handled. So this is a work queue, it's pretty much what, uh, what, what I'm doing most. There are other ways to configure your queue. You can have a pub sub system, so you have a producer that uh, gives a message to an exchange, that's the blue circle, and the exchange can configure to be a fan out. So in this scenario, the exchange will put the same message on two different queues and be consumed to two different consumers. So if consumer B goes down for a while now, all the messages will just pile up. And when consumer B comes back online next week, maybe, it will still read all the messages. Uh, Another more sophisticated way to configure your uh, queues is using a direct exchange, which is you give all your messages a routing key. So you can say this message has a routing key of foo, and the exchange now knows that, that it should send to consumer A. You can have multiple routing keys, or a queue can listen to multiple routing keys. You can also configure it like this. This is basically fine out, fan out. And you can also configure your exchange to be using topics. This is a little bit more, it's basically routing keys with the uh, wildcards. Uh, what I've explained to you now is 100% true with RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ, in the PHP world, RabbitMQ is the most popular uh, queue to use. Uh, it's using the AMQP protocol. And other queue implementations have the same concepts as I just explained, but the, uh, the naming may, may vary. Um, so let's leave 2013 behind. Let's leave all this theory behind. How would you work with a queue today? How would you do this today? And obviously, I, would like, I, I always work with Symfony Messenger. There are a few other examples that you can use, most of them have the same concepts. Symphony Messenger is by far the coolest, coolest one, in my opinion. I would use it seven days of the week. Um, Symphony Messenger started as basically a simple bus, uh, and then 
they they add some smooth integration with Symfony and added, and added loads of more features um, over the years. So Symfony Messenger is the uh, my my library of choice, and this is the one I'm gonna keep talking about. Um, and you also you you see this notification. I'm gonna draw them like this now, just because uh, I like animations, I guess. So let's have a look at a message. A message is just a normal PHP class. In this, in, in, in this example, I call it a send notification. It has a few properties, it has a constructor, and it has a few getters. Nothing fancy, nothing extraordinary about this class. And if I want to use this class in, in my um, controller, I create this uh, send notification object. I use some parameters from the HTTP, uh, HTTP request, and then I just say response, okay. I put the message on the bus and then I uh, return a new response. So if I would execute this controller, I'll have a page looking like this. And this is because Symfony is nice, so, so nice, so it tells us that we have missed to configure a handler for the send notification message. So let's configure a handler. A handler is just a normal class. I decide to call it send notification handler. It, the only thing that maybe you think is not normal is that it has an invoke method. And the invoke method uh, takes an argument, which is my message, my send notification message. And here for debug purposes or for demo purposes, I just echoing out like sending, not sending notifications to a user. And I need to tell Symfony that this is a message handler. So I can either use the code on the top or the configuration on top saying, hey, this class, make sure I tag it with a message handler. Or I can say something like, oh, everything in this directory, it's a message handler. Any of these will do fine. You could also do, use this marker interface. If you add a class with the message handler interface, the Symfony auto configure will figure out as, oh, this is a message handler. And it will automatically find the message you, you're handling. I, I hope this is okay. Uh, if I execute the controller now, I, um, I'll get something like this. So we actually send our notifications. And this is great. And I can just assume that you're like, wait. Anyhow, but what if, the, what if the notification takes long time to send? What if they take like 30 seconds to send each notification? I don't want to wait here as a user. So let's, let's do this asynch asynchronous. So to do things asynchronous, we need to introduce a new concept, and that concept is transports. Um, so you take a message, you give it to the bus, the bus gives you the transport, and at some point later, a worker will receive the message dun, 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 and give it back to the bus, and the bus finds the correct message handler. Uh, a transport has a few things. It has a sender and a receiver and transports are configurable with a DSN, and a transport also has a serializer. By default, Symfony is using the PHP serializer. And if I would configure this queue now, I say that I'm using this configuration saying, hey, mess framework mess in the transport, I want a new transport named default, and this is the DSN. And as you can see, if the DSN is using AMQP, like RabbitMQ. And then in the routing key, I say, if you see, a, if the bus sees a message named send notification, it should go on the default transport. So whenever I execute my controller again now, I get a page looking like this. I want to see okay. And I don't know if you believe me or not, but this executes really, really quickly. Uh, even though it took 30 seconds to send notification, this is instant. And that's basically because we didn't do much work here. We just put the message on the queue. I haven't sent any notifications yet. So to send notifications, we need to run this command, the bin console messenger consume messages. And what this does is just start a worker that receives the message. It's basically a, a while through. It's just, it's a worker, it asks the transport, hey, can I give a message? And if I got a message, I give it to the bus. And then it's just doing the same thing over and over again. And of course, in your applications, you, oops, no. So, and of course, in your applications, you don't have any memory issues, right? So, but other people might. So there are some restrictions you can add to this command. You can have like limited to maximum 100 messages and then die, or just run for five minutes and then die, or uh, just use uh, 200 megabytes of memory. 
And you'll keep this command alive using supervisor. So again, a very common transport in the PHP world is RabbitMQ. Uh, there are multiple other transports. The messenger components ships with four of them. And in Symfony 5.1, they're all in the separate package. So just I mean, if, using, if you want to use Redis or SQS, you just install this package. And if you are going to do something that is not supported by natively by Symfony, there is a bridge to PHP and Q. And PHP and Q is this organization that's created adapters to most, if not all, message brokers. So if you want to use Kafka or PubSub or anything else, the, the PHP and Q bridge is, is uh, the way to go. Um, so if you have an application and uh, you yeah, basically you can have multiple applications and you can communicate between them using a queue. So you can send your message, put it on the bus, give it to transport, and it goes in the queue. And depending on how you configure your queue, this message can be consumed by another applications and find their handler. And in this scenario, app one and app two could be the same code base. It's just one is deployed on one server and not, not deployed on the other server. So app one maybe just handle HTTP traffic and app two is responsible for sending emails or generating PDFs and stuff. And you could have a second message that you put on a queue and it goes to transport and then put on a bus, goes to transport, then to the queue and it can sit on the queue for a while. And at some point you can configure it to go back to the worker, back to the bus, the message handler. So this is all how you configure your how you configure the messenger component and how you configure your queue. Uh, and in this in this configuration example, I have two transports. One is my default worker queue and one is to app two. And I've decided that uh, the send notification message should go to both transports. Uh, I want to show you that the, the configuration and your queue, con queue configuration is really powerful and your core this is important, your core application doesn't know or care where the message came from. It doesn't care if it came from uh, HTTP, CLI, or the queue. It's just execute the message. So I hope I've showed you that it's fairly simple to do an Hello World application, and it's super flexible uh, if you need it to be. But obviously, when I'm demoing a new feature, a new component like this, you should ask yourself, is it really that simple? And the answer is always, it depends. So let's consider something, <laughs> some of the not hello world things. Um, consider this code. This is me creating a class and then I creating an object of that class, adding some value and then I serializing it. And if foo was a message I put on a bus, the output will be the, the data I put in a queue. So think for yourself, what would the output of this small script be? It will be a string looking like this. And this string is not super nice. Like if this was a string that you, that you sent to the Java application and the Java developers should read and parse this, Java developer would, would probably look down on you. Um, and so this, this is, doesn't look nice, but it works. However, what happened if you, if you change the name of the private property bar? If you change the name of the private property bar, this output will change. And this output is basically the API or the contract between your app and the job application. So if you accidentally refactor a private property, you'll break the job application. And that's, that's, that's not the situation we're going to be in. That's, that's obviously obviously bad. I, when usually when I talk about the messaging component, uh, people say to me, oh, I love the messaging component, it's great. However, you cannot use it for communication between two apps. And they, they refer to this exact scenario. And I say, yes, you can, but you cannot use the default serializer. So if you're using a different serializer, maybe you did something like this, you, have, you could define a version of the message, you can define an identifier the message, and you in this payload function you have a you have very much control over how the output would look like, and so you don't accidentally break stuff if you refactor minor things, and this would generate a output of uh, that looks like this, 
and this is way more way more pleasing to look at and way more easy for a, for a foreign language to parse and use and this is just an example of a serializer there you could basically make your own serializer or use the symphony serializer instead of the php serializer it's all configurable a, another thing i want to share with you it's i you may have heard of CQRS. I'm a big fan of CQRS, or I'm a big fan of my version of CQRS. CQRS is Command Query Responsibility Segregation, which means that you can have a command, a thing that is doing something, or you can have a query, a thing that is fetching something. You can never have a thing that is updating a value and then returning it. It should always do, always do one or the other. So you should separate those two. And I'm also a big fan of separating my actions, my commands, from reactions, like something happened. So since this, since this is something I like to work with, I want to enforce this in the message uh, component. So I've created three message buses. I have my command, which have, uh, which have exactly one command handler. I have my query, which have exactly one query handler and return some data. And I have my event and zero or more event subscribers and if you are um, if you also like this i just configured my my buses like this i just named them like this and i added my, my default bus and if i could enforce my arbitrary rules with some middleware say here I add some validation middleware and i make sure that you can have multiple handlers of the event bus i'm also know that since a command is the only way to change the state of my application. I can have an event store middleware that sends all the commands to an event store. And when you have multiple buses like this, you may want to add this line to your uh, services YAML. This makes sure if you have a service that expect the message bus and you name it event bus, then you name the variable event bus, it, you will get the message bus event bus uh, service. And when, <laughs> when I first did this talk i was i was researching a lot and i found this out and i was i was pretty excited so i put it on a slide and, and shared it with everybody when i told the audience the audience they they didn't have this look of uh, inner they didn't look as happy or pleased as i was with this new fact so i asked them like hey did you know about this and most of the people did and i was basically the only one in the room who didn't know about this and I assume that this is the same scenario here, but I'd like to keep this slide around uh, keep this slide around because I want to remind myself that even though I consider myself being a symphony expert, there are plenty of people that know more than me. Uh, anyhow, back to the uh, handlers. All my query handlers, command handlers, event subscribers, they look pretty much the same. They're in the, from the message components perspective, they are pretty much the same. The only difference is in the, my query handler is this line when I return something. But the messages and the, command, and the handlers, they are, they are the same. It's just a matter of how I relate to them. I, as a developer, how I relate to my different buses. Uh, and I also want to stress that if you have a command handler, you are allowed to dispatch events from a command handler. In fact, in, in my application, it's encouraged. Like here we have a send notification. I may want to dispatch an event saying, oh, a notification was sent. And maybe someone interested, maybe someone isn't interested in that event. You are also allowed to dispatch commands from command handlers. However, I always feel kind of funny when I do that. I, I, I don't really like the feeling. There is no technical argument why you shouldn't, except for it makes debugging really, really hard. But you're, you're perfectly fine and allowed to do it. But I, I try to avoid it. Um, one thing, like, if you have a talk about messenger component, you have to mention envelopes. I don't know, but that's the rule somehow. Uh, an envelope, technically it works like this. You have your message and you put it inside an envelope. And the envelope goes on the bus, goes on the transport, goes on the queue. And at some point later, it, the worker receives it, put it back to the message bus and you unpack the message and the message is given to the uh, message handler. And most of the time when you're using a message, message component, you don't know or care about envelopes. They might be interesting if you're writing your own middlewares. But envelopes are super useful because on an envelope, you also, also have stamps. And a stamp is a great way to put metadata. Say metadata, you want to say, if you're using the validation middleware, 
you maybe want to say which validation group to use. And that's what that's where using a stamp. And you might also in, in, internally, the, the worker is using a stamp to tell the message bus that, hey, this message has already been on the queue. Don't put it in the queue again. Uh, I hope you're fine with stamps and envelopes. I'm going to move on to something more, way more complicated, handling failures. Handling failures in synchronous programming is simple, but if you're doing async, it gets tricky. It gets tricky really, really fast. So consider this scenario. You have your message. It goes on the bus. It goes on the transport. It goes on the queue. Uh, maybe at one second, maybe one week later, it comes back to the worker and work put it on the bus and goes to the message handler. And in your message handler, bam, an error happened. It's not clear what we should do now. We cannot put that error message to the user in the controller in, in the web page because that user may be long gone. Like this might may happen one week later, the user was online in your system. So again, it's not clear what you should do. So by default, uh, by design, you have the transport deciding what to do. Um, and the default transport, you just put it back on the queue. It just put it back on the queue, and at some point later, the worker will receive it again and put it on the bus, and you'll, you basically try again. And this may may work, but again, it's, it's a bit more complex than that. And I, I can paint you a little bit more, a little bit more complex uh, scenario. Consider this create user handler. It creates, uh, it takes a create user command. It creates a new user. It persists it and it flushes it to the database. And then it's starting to create a location. And on this line, get address. So for some reason, it throws an exception. So the message will go back on the transport and back on the queue and be retried later. And the next time we're trying ex this exact create user command, you will be you will fail to create a user because this username is already in use because you already created a user so what happened now is we have an event on the queue that cannot be processed and you have your application in an invalid state because you have a user without the location so a solution to this could be that you use the doctrine transaction middleware and this middleware may look complicated uh, the only thing it really does is it takes everything the handler does and put it in the same doctrine transaction. So if you get an exception when you're creating a location, as in the previous example, it will roll back the creation of the user. So nothing will be written. If something exception happened in, the, in your message handler, nothing will be written to the database. So, okay, this is pretty cool. Everything works fine. What happens our create, in, if in our create user handler, we also, dispatch the command, oh, sorry, dispatch an event. So we create a user, we create a location, and we then dispatch a user was created event. And say a event listener maybe wanna send an email saying, hey, welcome, a welcome email to the user. If the email service is down, they will throw an exception. And that exception will make sure to roll back your doctrine transaction. So you have now we have a scenario where the user cannot be created because your email server is down. And most of the time, you don't care if the welcome email gets sent or not. And also most of the time, you can send the welcome email later, like a minute later or a day later when the email service is up and running again. So what you wanna do here, you wanna add an envelope with an, uh, I'm gonna lift it up for you. You wanna add an envelope with a stamp saying, the stamp should be dispatch of the current bus stamp. So. This means that we should handle this user was created after the doctrine transaction. Like we should handle it after the doctrine transaction is committed. And you can use some synthetic sugar to make this look more pretty. Um, you can also uh, configure the failure. Uh, you, I'm talking about the default failure strategy. You can configure it yourself if you like. A normal way is to use a failure transport. Here I define in my configuration that my failed transport is named failed. And as you can see from my failed transport, I'm using a doctrine DSN, which means that I'm gonna store my uh, messages in the database. And looking at my work queue transport, you see that I have a retry strategy. I'm saying you should retry a message four times 
and you should have a delay of one second between each tries. And then you should also have a multiplier of four. So if a error happened, I wait for one second and trying again. If the same, if, if an error still happens, I wait for four seconds and then try again. And then it's for 16 and then for 30, because 30 is my, uh, 30 seconds is my maximum. This, the, the, the multiplier and the math behind here, you have, to, you have to look at the code. It's using powers and stuff. I wrote a, I wrote a small blog post about it and that strategy that I'm using. I'm basically retrying them for about 20 days. And if I haven't fixed the errors in 20 days, I just discard the message. Um, you can use it with every strategy you like, but if you have messages on your failure queue, you have a few symphony commands that you can run that helps you managing your queue. You can look at them, you can retry the first one, you can retry a bunch of them, you can remove them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a last word about errors. All exception thrown by your handler is wrapped in handler failed exception. This is super important to remember when you're trying to do error handling. All exceptions are wrapped in handler failed exception. Uh, Next topic, creating new entities. If you're writing an API, you may have a controller that is similar to this. You want to create a new user, so you're dispatching a create new user command. And then you want to be nice and say, hey, your user is created, go to this URL. But you don't know the user ID. I mean, you know the user is created because, the, um, because you didn't get an exception, but you don't know the user ID. So the solution here is, just to, use an, is to use a UUID. So instead of saying create a user with this username, you say create a user with this UID and username. And now you can you modify your controller and you know the UID. You know, since you don't get, didn't get an exception, you know which UID this user has. And also, I was a bit quick there. Did you notice these lines? This is validation. It's using the same symphony validation as you, use, as you normally use in forms. And the message handler can now be sure that all usernames are, have at least three characters and they're not blank. And if you're writing an API, you might want to be nice to, to your API users to have a, a exception listener, uh, basically an event. And you can write something like this, like if there is a validation fail exception, write a good, uh, valid, uh, write a good uh, error response. And note here that I have a validation failed exception because this exception is thrown by a middleware, not my handler. If it wasn't a handler, it should be a handler failed exception. And you should probably, logic here, we should probably ask for a um, message uh, handler failed exception. So how about testing? If you are, if you, if you should write tests for your application. And if you are smart or lazy, uh, you decide what, you could make sure that you configure your transports as a synchronous transport, which basically means that you don't talk with RabbitMQ and other queue, you always handle this synchronously. Uh, this works, it's fine, it's, you're, you're being lazy, but sometimes you are. Uh, if you take testing a little, bit, a little bit more seriously, you may want to use the in-memory transport. That allows you to test your controllers doing something like this, you make your uh, request to controller, assert the controller is returning the correct response. And then you can get your in-memory transport and see what messages were put on the, on the me message bus, what, what messages were put on the transport. And you can make sure that you are correct messages in the correct format, et cetera. Uh, one, one last scenario I wanna share with you. This is something I recently learned. Um, Consuming, trans consuming messages from different transports. So imagine this scenario. You have a register user message or command. You have your UID, username, and IP address. And the handler looks something like this. You create a new user, you persist it, and then you dispatch a user was created event. Uh, and the user was created event looks like this. And you, you are, you are using the dispatch of the current bus to make sure exceptions are handled properly, etc. But you can, oh, you, and you can imagine there are a few, a few things you want to do when a user was registered. Like our business case here is that we want to show the user a welcome page saying, "Oh, hey, welcome. The weather in Stockholm is this." So 
when a user is registered, we want to find the location from the, the IP of the user. We also want to send the user a welcome email saying, hey, well, thank you for using your service, blah, blah, blah. However, we want to send the welcome email as a background task. We want to do the welcome email asynchronous, asynchronously, but we want to say the uh, find the location synchronously. So if we have configuration like this, I say in my routing key, I want to say user was created. I want to put that on a work queue. Now both event handlers will be uh, asynchronous. So the trick we want to do here is we want to create a synchronous transport and then say that the user was registered should be on both transports, both the sync one and the work queue one. And, but we're not done here because with this configuration only, we, the event handlers will see the same events twice, both on the sync, both on the sync transport and the work queue transport. So we need to modify our event handlers. We need to add them a message subscriber interface. And we want to say that this specifically event, event handler, message handler, is interested in the user was registered, but only if it comes from the work queue. Same thing with the synchronous queue, the synchronous transport. Tobias, sorry to interrupt that. We're getting close to time uh, uh, to wrap up really quickly, if you can. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I think oh, we I lost think your we audio there. I'm hearing myself. Oh, we have a oh, question. We have a question. 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 Waiting for feedback. Okay, do you hear me? It's a bias of loss. I do hear you. I do hear you. Multiple times though. Times though. Times though. Times though. Times though. Times though. Yeah, me the same. Okay, so the first question is. If the dispatch after bus uh, is such a cool stamp, why it's not uh, used by default? Because you would never actually want to dispatch a message immediately. You would always want to dispatch it after. Um, that's an excellent question. We discussed it a lot when implementing this. And the truth is that most of the case, you're correct. You want to use the dispatch of the current bus, but that's not 100% true technically. There are scenarios that you want to dispatch it uh, at the same time. So the middleware that handles this is enabled by default, but it gives you the control to opt in or opt out of this feature. Okay. But yeah, uh, uh, so, te so, so technically. You also talked about um, decoupling from frameworks in the beginning of your speech, and then you told that uh, you are using uh, Symphony Messenger and you're kind of coupling to the message bus interface. Is that okay for you now, or you still try to decouple and create another interface to be able to switch Symphony Messenger to another library? Uh, well, when I say decoupled from the framework, you should not be in a position when you can switch out your framework on a week. You should make sure that you should keep your framework stuff in the infrastructure layer. Uh, okay. And the message handlers, they are the one that belongs to your core. And oh. that's, that's in the message handler and all the services the message handlers are using. That's where you shouldn't use uh, it too heavily symphony stuff. Um, I, yes, I'm using a marker interface on my messages but that's just to ease my configuration. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to decouple at the, at the degree that I can use, switch out to use an, an, a new framework tomorrow. That's, that's no point of doing that. Okay, because that's what uh, Matthias talks about pretty often. That's why I'm asking. And, I, and I'm on the same yeah. point with you here. <laughs> yeah. And so something you should really take in, uh, take, consider when you're reading blog posts and smart people saying what you should do, they are always extremist. You should listen to them, take the few things you like, and then just use them yourself. You should not go the full length. That's, that's okay. my opinion. You use it if you like. Take okay. what you like from it. 
So we'll take half of Absolutely. your Absolutely. Thank you so much, today. Tobias. Oh, sorry to interrupt there. <laughs> no, no, that, that's yeah. okay. Thank you for your answers. Or we can continue right here. Yeah, yeah, we're, we, we've got to um, actually transition to a break. So thank you so much for the, the questions and thanks, Tobias, for the, the talk. Um, we, uh, if you would like to join Tobias and others in the Zoom room, you'll be able to ask more questions, socialize a little bit. Uh, so feel free to do that. We are going to be entering uh, a break. I'm here now. What did I finish about? I did not finish to wrapping up and saying, I'm giving you a lot of, a lot of uh, building blocks now. I told you about basic stuff and advanced stuff. Now you can build everything yourself. I just missing my last slide. That's, uh, <laughs> that, that's poor planning, I guess. Um, if nobody, uh, oh, okay, I can ask another question. I have, uh, so I actually use uh, Symphony Messenger a lot and, uh, I thought, what about controlling for the number of handlers uh, in the configuration at compile time instead of checking that after? So now if you want to have exactly one handler per command in the command bus, uh, you have to, it will be checked later when it's actual dispatch, not in the compile time. But that could have been done in the messenger pass, I guess, so to check whether each command has exactly one handler. Yes, you need to, Yes, and then but in the messenger pass, you need to then uh, instantiate all the, the handlers. Or, or I mean, you need to create this map and you need to validate that the map and you also need to make, make sure, no, because you don't know which bus you're gonna use. You can have multiple handlers, uh, one bus only allowing one handler, another bus is allowing multiple handlers, and you don't know which bus the message is gonna be dispatched at. So that's why you cannot do it at the compile time. Yes, but you can check that within one bus, one command can be handled only by one handler. Correct, but you don't know if that bus is going to be used in runtime. Um, okay, but okay, I'll if, think about it. <laughs> yeah, but but if you have all the buses that only allowed one handler, then you could figure that out in compile time with a lot of logic. Okay. Um, Good so question. I, um, I also would like to ask. Oh, I remember th there's something wrong going in the chat, but uh, uh, somebody asked about async uh, AWS, uh, AWS, which you have recently created mm -hmm. with another colleague, right? Yeah. And so um, it is uh, based on the Symfony HTTP client, right? Correct. And uh, at the same time, you are uh, the creator of the PSR18. Uh, and so how do you feel about that? Like you are using now a <laughs> Symfony HTTP client instead of that PSR client. Um, I, using HTTP client in Symfony in PHP is kind of strange. Um, you, you basically have Gossel, you have so, some, some more, and you have Symf Symfony and you have Bust, which is kind of not maintained anymore. Um, I, I believe that if you're using an open source library, you should use uh, PSR18. Gossel 7 is going to support PSR18 uh, whenever we release that. There's a beta one released now. And Symfony, Symfony's clients also support PSR18. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm currently doing is if I'm using something in, privately in my app, I'm using Symfony. Symfony's HP client, and if I'm using something from uh, in a th third-party library, I'm using uh, writing that with PSR18. Uh, I yes, it's it's strange and it's weird, and the reason is that we have too many abstractions, too many things, too many PSR. Like if you're gonna write a proper library with using HTTP, you're gonna have PSR7, you're gonna have PSR17, and then you got a PSR18, and then you gotta make sure you construct them in a good way so be interoperability. And at some point I'm like, I just wanna say, I just gonna fetch a website. It's not gonna be so much hassle. And that's why Symfony went a different route to not using HTTP. HTTP uh, the PSR, PSR for HTTP clients. So I, I feel positive and I feel excited for that. But if I'm going to write something open source, I'm using PSR 18. Uh, okay. Uh, 
So then I have one more question. Uh, you showed us the uh, hexagonal architecture. Do you still use that approach? Uh, yes, as I said in the end, or the, uh, you, I'm using that the bits I like. Oh, okay. I'm not going the full line. I'm just using the things I like the most. And uh, yeah, my question is about how do you organize your package structure or namespace structure? Do you split them by layers or by features or how do you combine these things? Th that's, that's super interesting. Uh, <laughs> I know there's a uh, project from the German and sensor labs. It's called deep track, which yeah. actually forces you to define that this should be layer one, this should be layer two and layer three, and you can have rules between them. I am not that structured. I, have, I don't have any fancy structure in my, source, in my source code. I have folders for controllers, commands, services, and then models, entities. It, so looking at my source code, you, you don't know that I'm, I'm a big fan of hexagonal architecture. Uh, but you know when you're looking at the code and if you always, you basically have three entry points in my application. You have CLI, controller, and uh, from uh, events which is also basically CLI. And if all of these entry points just creates a message and gives a message bus, you know everything else is your core. Okay. So, yeah. So you basically stick with the original Symfony structure, which is used Correct. in the documentation. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. Because it works for me. That's, that's okay. a simple answer. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that's the best argumentation. And... Um, Okay, there's uh, Michael Glatke who would like to ask a question. The organizer should probably switch the mic to him, the microphone. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Um, okay, but that disappeared. Okay, then I have uh, my last question. <laughs> uh, if you're doing an API uh, and you have a DTO which um, represents the incoming request, and then with, so you, you have that DTO as an argument within your controller, and then you transform that DTO into a message which will be sent to the bus. Uh, do you do something like that? And if yes, then where do you have your validation rules? In the first DTO layer or in the messages as you have shown? That, that's, that's excellent. Uh, I, I've decided to have, um, it, I, I've tried with different things. I've, I've tried to, in my controller, just create the, the message. And I and the message itself doesn't enforce any types, enforce anything, but I use validation to to do it on message directly. I've also tried to using a DTO to, and then copy the DTO to a message, but I also realized it's too much of copying like mm -hmm. from one object to another. So to make things simple, I've only used messages uh, mm -hmm. and I have the validation on the messages. Uh, what you should look out for is if your controller takes, takes values from to say the query parameter, the query parameter, they could be an array. So, mm -hmm the message should not have any type shakes. You should allow, because if you have type shakes, you get a PHP error and it, that, those are very hard to catch. So what you should do, you should allow all possible types and then use the validation component to validate and then catch the validation exception because that's, that's how you can print out nice messages to the API mm -hmm. client. So no details, I'm using the messenger message instead and put validation messages to keep things simple. Okay. Um... Then I think that's all for this discussion. Um, and I have asked all my questions. <laughs> I was actually asked to, uh, to figure out the best question, <laughs> but since they yeah. were all mine and I'm the moderator, I don't, well, <laughs> if you like some of my questions the most, then <laughs> yeah. they will yeah, give yeah, me yeah, a present. Yeah, it was good questions. <laughs> I like them. Okay. Uh, so then, thank you. Hope to see you at uh, Disneyland uh, in December at Symphony yeah. Conf. Uh, definitely, definitely. So bye bye then. Thank Lovely. you. Bye. See you. See ya.